So first, why do we use steel is the first question. Why do we have to? Uh, the background mostly lies with, uh, uh, with seismic resistance. That is what I think that we need to encourage a lot of steel structures. So what is the need for seismic resistance structures and how can we ensure seismic resistance structures? So this is the basic geography uh, on the left side. Um, you can see that the, uh, we can see that this, uh, in the, in, you know, this is the Eurasian plate and this is the Indian plate that is hitting. So basically we are actually hitting towards the Tibetan region quite some time. And due to this, there are prominent earthquakes that you saw, see on the right side. The, the ones that are dark indicates they are high in Richard scale. The ones that are light and hollow are actually low in Richard scale. Actually, uh, we have been moving for uh, close to 16 to 16 centimeters at the maximum per year towards the Eurasian plate. But uh, that does not tell you the story because places, this is the right side is the uh, Indian earthquake map as per 1970. The one that is red in color indicates that it is highly seismic, so uh, prone to seismic activity. So the right side is basically your northeastern states as well as your northern part of Kashmir. But uh, the ones that are lighter in color are the places where you don't have much of seismic activity. But so you go by this design and you design and you see suddenly Latour happening at a place where there was no seismic activity. So you go back and do what you do. You change, calibrate all your seismic design provisions and next time when it comes you classify Latour as a highly seismic prone zone. So it is more of a probability when and where the earthquake will happen. Okay. And so the seismic map that we have on the right side is 2002. The one on the left is 1970. So you can see the index zone 1 to zone 5. Zone 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So basically the thing that is white in color has very less seismic activity. The one that is on the right side, which is darker in color, or how? High seismic activity. But you see the next slide here. The next here you have 2002. All those things that have been in white have turned into blue. So those things that were not seismically active have become seismically active in 2002. Don't forget 2004, we had tsunami. So the latest code actually has another areas where it skipped zone 1, and 2002 it has zone 2 to 5. Right? The latest seismic codal provisions also skipped zone 2, so it states 3, 4, and 5. So the entire nation is divided into three seismic categories. So in the U.S. they call, you know, I've been, I spent a lot of time in the U.S., more than a decade, studying, working. So they call devil of the deep blue sea. So either you're caught with earthquake or with a cyclone. So this is the cyclone map of India. So unlike other countries, we have 7,500 kilometers of coastline. So we have 66 districts, and almost all of these places are battered every year. So seismic may come or may not come in a lifetime of a structure, but we cannot afford to avoid cyclone. So we get cyclone activities on the, on the entire coastal map of India. So we put, so these are because, because of cy cyclone what happens, we have a lot of rural structures that are poor connection at the corners, and then there is no connection between the roof and the wall. So due to this, you know, once you lose the roof of the structure, the entire structure is exposed, the entire structure collapses. And most of these structures are mud, load-bearing walls. They do not take into account any lateral activity. By lateral, I mean any forces that are acting in this direction. Almost all the forces are acting this way, vertical. So we still haven't had the thought of designing anything for lateral. And this is what happens when you have cyclone failure in Odisha. You can see fairly every one of the structures have been completely demolished. It, what we get is rubbles. And one thing it is very clear is that none of these have any type of reinforcement. It's just mud brick walls with no lateral reinforcement, hence it has very less ductility and hence it's prone to. It's a pack of cards. When you apply the lateral load, it goes off. And this is a history of cyclones that has happened. Uh, we continuously get cyclone actually for the last 10 years. We have got more cyclones as well as more earthquake activities. So in the left side, we have the seismic map of India. On the right side, we have the cyclone map of India, where the regions that are relatively free from earthquake, that is the coastal regions, are actually hit by cyclone. So where we don't have any effect of cyclone, say for example, the northeastern parts, we are hit with 
the northeastern part which is red in color. So we don't have a choice. We have to design either for seismic or for wind. It just cannot ignore, right? Even in the codal provisions, if you look at IS 800, it says that um, dead load, wind load, and environmental loads, and environmental loads can be either seismic or wind. You don't have to do it for both, which is based on an assumption that, uh, you know, both of them don't occur simultaneously, but you have to choose the one that is greater, and then you design it for that. So you have a load combination that you have to do. So my major thought was, you know, how do we incorporate that, and at the same time give our Indian citizens an affordable housing? So these are some of the houses that are, you know, affordable houses that have been built. Uh, by affordable, I mean light gauge steel structures. Basically, these are houses that are in the US. I have lived in some of these houses, trailers. Um, uh, this is more like a construction trailer, actually. So you can live nothing, they will, you will not see any change, except that you will have a very nice interior, except that when you come outside, you will see that you, it is a different type of structure. It's very nice, you can also use it for villas. It is extensively be, being used in China. It's very nice, and it only takes five to six days to construct the entire structure. All it needs is a person, very skilled person, to have a screw gun and a self-tapping screw. Each screw is one rupee. So you have two connections. You just connect everything and get it done. The only thing that takes time is your foundation, because the foundation has to set. So, so this is my, basically my research work. So everything here is a component of a wall. Right, so I basically come down to the wall. So the inside portion that is blue in color is your blue color gypsum CFS stud, and the exterior sheathing is called the gypsum sheathing. It can be gypsum sheathing, it can be oriental board or cement board, or it can be even a light gauge steel structure as well, a thin light gauge. So these are, these are my key research work. So most of these loads are subjected to lateral loads, basically bending due to earthquake or wind. So how do we study this? So this is uh, the, uh, if you look at here the sheathing and you see you can have Z section or you can have a C section or you can have a hat section depending upon which section that you want to put inside, depending upon how much load it is, what is the thickness of it, what is the depth of it, all those things come into picture. And then you have a sheathing board that is covering both of them and then you put self-tapping screws or nails that you see sheathing board as well as fastener spacing, the, the amount of fastener spacing, these things have to be determined. So anybody can talk many things, but at the time of doing things, it's the detail that is more important. What is the thickness? What is the length? What is the screw spacing? What is the diameter screw? What is the length of the screw? What is the torque that has to be applied to the screw? So, so many details are involved, especially when you put your Indian citizens inside a house that is supposed to prevent you from earthquake and cyclone. So, unless we do a large scale testing, we cannot arrive at very conclusive evidence. Theory will give you certain things, but after a while it stops. You know, when you write a codal provision, unfortunately, the gentleman before me presented IS 800 and he said there was a big gap of five years or six years. The codal provisions that we have for uh, coal form steel is, was last revised in 1975. So 41 years we have not done anything with the coal provision. So you can see the state of affairs for using a coal form steel. So what do we do? Basically in our lab we simulate this kind of thing by applying a load, gypsum board and try to understand the bending capacity of that structure. But before we do all that stuff we need to know what is the, uh, what is the, 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 the section has some kind of imperfections. The section is not very straight. As you know, the member is very thin and is subjected to imperfections. Imperfections are deviations from actual geometry. Imperfections are basically classified into two categories. One is your geometric imperfection, and other is your uh, material imperfections. Uh, let's not worry about material imperfection because for material imperfections, coal form steel are not very much affected, unlike hot rolled steel. So let me just go into geometric imperfections alone. Um, so in order to quantify geometric imperfections, uh, this is the to topic we purchased uh, equipment on the right side. This is a 3D laser scanner. The, this is what you get when you scan the, scan the C channel. This is an unlipped C channel. This is what you get when you scan. So why do I need to study imperfections, first of all, right? That's the question that is in everybody's mind. When you do a concrete, right, concrete casting or something like that, when you cast the concrete, you take certain amount of concrete and make a cube out of it and a cylinder out of it, and then you do compression testing, and you do split tensile strength to find out the split tensile tensiles. And why do you do? Because you have to characterize the material. Unless we know what is the carrying capacity of the material, the characterization is more important. So 
akin to that, we have to characterize the steel structures because it is very thin, it is subjected to imperfections. So what are the different types of imperfections? Before we go into that, how does it affect the load carrying capacity? So you see that the one at the top is the test. The test is dark in color. And then the dotted lines with the red color is uh, finite element analysis without local imperfection. And then on the bottom, you have a dark color with imperfection. So when you include imperfections, the actual values are matching with your test strength. If you don't incorporate imperfection, there is a strength is there is a change in strength by 20%, which means that it gives you a fictitious load carrying capacity, which is not correct. Because you cannot do testing for every structure. You have to do some level of analysis. And in order to do analysis, you have to know what is the type of imperfections that I have to give it to my structure. So what is this imperfection? So imperfections are basically deviations from actual geometry. There are two types. The right side is the global imperfection, which is called three types, bow, camber, and twist. Bow is nothing but a major axis, uh, minor axis bending. The center one is your camber, that is your similar, to, similar to your major axis bending. And the twisting is when you apply a torsion, so it is twisting. On the left side, you have crown. Can I have some, somebody replace the batteries for this? Excuse me, sir. It's very difficult to. Can you just replace these batteries for me? So the left side is your ideal cross section. Then you have some type of thing called B, is called crown. Excuse me. You don't have batteries. No, no, it's not working here. It won't show. OK. So I learned something new today that I cannot use my pointer on an LED screen. OK. So on the left side, you have this ideal section. And the, on the, this one, next one is the crown. And then you have the dent. Then you have the twist, flare, and overbend. So basically, these are different types of imperfections that comes. Why do we have imperfections? Because this is made from press break. You know what a press break is? So basically, this comes like a roll of paper, paper toilet roll paper. It's, you know, it, cold form steel comes in a very odd, you know, just like a paper sheet. And then you put it in a roller, and you get the desired geometry. In doing so, the Indian worker will introduce some kind of imperfections. And unless we standardize those imperfections, we cannot do analysis. Unless we do analysis, we cannot quantify the load carrying capacity. And unless we quantify the load carrying capacity, we cannot suggest any codal provisions. Unless we suggest any codal provisions, we may not be able to use that for our affordable housing. So basically, that's it. So, but there are also other things that I wanted to point out. So if you, if you have an incorrect stretch width, you have these kind of deviations arising here. But these are not uh, imperfection. These are error in incorrect stretch width. Basically, the fellow has shortened the stretch width. So because of shorting the stretch width, he got the width correctly, but the depth is wrong. Or he can get the depth correctly, the width is wrong it can, due to shortening. That is on the left side. If he makes an error in marking where is the width, where is the depth, you get too much depth or too much width. OK, so these are not errors and imperfections. These are actually, these are not, uh, these are fabrication errors. So before we go into that, I first wanted to study what is the need for carrying out imperfections. Have people have studied for imperfections? Yes, they have studied for the last 50 years for imperfections, very long period of time. But the problem is, but the problem is there is no generalized formulation available. The question is, is it necessary to have a generalized formulation? And the answer is yes, we need to. And this is what happens. So see, when you have a thicker member, on the rightmost side, you don't have any imperfections. As you reduce your thickness, you go to the left, you have imperfections, the deviations from the ideal geometry. Right? So how do we quantify that? And uh, this is the codal provisions that we, I took from uh, AISI, American Iron and Steel Institute. And you can see that these codal provisions gives uh, uh, the t t amount of tolerances that are applicable for choosing your coal form steel sections. But unfortunately, the tolerance on the left side, it, it tells you that the imperfection magnitude is regardless of the shape or geometry. It does not tell you that the imperfection geometry is with respect to channel or a hat section or an Z section. For every section, it is the same imperfection. At the same time, it also tells you that the imperfection is constant with, re with regard to the properties also. If it is a 5 mm thick material, it's the same imperfection. Or if it is a 10 mm thick material, it is the same imperfection. So we did a lot of studies close to 188 specimens we 
tested all these imperfections. The C1 up to C19, 19 different sections. For each one, we took six specimens. So because we wanted to be consistent, and these are lips channels. This is how we measured it. We put the material on this one. We connected it, and this is the scanning arm. This is very expensive equipment, 40, 40 lakh rupees. So you scan the entire imperfection. You get a 3D data, basically. From the data, you have to extract the results. And this is the realistic uh, way of doing things. So this is, the, this is the gun, the imperfection gun. It's very expensive. And you put these, all these things to make sure that they are aligned properly. And this can rotate 360 degrees. And you see, naturally, it has a bow, which is called a minor axis bending. Then you have a camber when you get that. And these are several things. What did we do? We basically did one thing. We superimposed the imperfections along with the ideal geometry, collected close to 81,000 data points, 27 specimens. For each 1 mm, we collected the data. And uh, we studied all these things. And then we used some nasty mathematics. Not that difficult, but simple geometry. We calculated all these imperfections, basically. And we formulated several imperfection magnitudes. Basically, this, the code says that the top and the bottom has the same imperfection as per AISA. But when we do the scanning, the top one has 21 mm, the bottom one is 3 mm. So there, basically, there is an error. It does not consider the L over RY. L over RY is the slenderness of the section. So when it is in bow, which is minor axis bending, you have to take the slenderness of the minor axis bending in order to formulate these equations. And then you have this. This is the bow magnitude. And uh, the code says nothing is the same, regardless of what it is. And then we went for, we studied all these things. We plotted it. We saw a trend. So the more the slenderness, more is the imperfection, or more is the imperfection for the bow. We did the same thing for C channel without lip and with lip. We see that with lip, it is less imperfections. 4.77 compared to 7.79 because a lipped one acts as a stiffened plate, whereas an unlipped one does not act as a stiffened plate. Several things we did. Again, the trend was very clear with respect to slenderness of the ratio. We plotted all these points. We got a very nice equation. This is what we need, actually. We did the same thing for camber as well. Camber is the major axis bending. We got an equation. But uh, clearly, the difference between camber and bow are different. But the code says it should be the same. This is the most su super superior code available for coal form steel design, American Iron and Steel Institute. But even that code has tremendous amount of flaws associated with that. Okay, This is the most super good code that you can get right now with the latest technology. I pointed out. Last month, I was in Denmark. I met with many of the people who developed this code. They all agreed that they, it has errors. I showed my results. They were very impressed. And we are trying to make codal provisions in Indian code, IS801, to incorporate the result work so that our code is much superior than other codes. And uh, same thing with twist. I can go on and on. Crown, twist. This is the J value. J is, I know, hope I'm just getting into details. J is, Torsional constant, anybody who's in steel design might know that. And the same thing, I continued for local imperfections also, more results, more data to be plotted. Basically, we've got equations after equations. And uh, somebody asked me whether how the equations are correct. So we did a residual study and said that the, the number of dots on top of the zero line and the number of dots on the bottom of the zero line are more or less the same. So the residue is very small. Hence. The reliability of the structure is very high. Conclusions, I just told you, we studied a large number of sections. We got equations for every one of them. Now we have characterized the imperfections, which can be used for analysis. Analysis tell you the truth, which is what is the exact load carrying capacity. Once we know the load carrying capacity, we know exactly what is the amount of partial safety factor that we have to use for design, because everything boils down to money. If you use an incorrect partial safety factors, then you will lose more money. So this will tell you the truth as it is. That aside, I just wanted to talk a few things on steel. This is my research, but this is my passion as well. So many people said many, many different things about steel, but this is what I think about a few things. First of all, since independence, 70 years, we have, as a nation, quadrupled, more than quadrupled our population. Right? 
So which means that we are now 1.3 billion compared to 300 billion million when we got independence. So there is no way we can expand this direction. The only way that if you have to provide housing for everyone, this is how we have to go. So that is the bottom line. And only way is for high-rise buildings. And now our country is more prone to seismic activities and cyclone. There is no other material, in my opinion, which can satisfy the seismic requirements other than structural steel. Don't get confused with the rebar, structural steel. Okay. Because, you know, anybody who has done design there is called seismic response coefficient R factor. More the R factor, lesser is the load because you divide it in your denominator. Structural engineers, I hope you understand what I'm talking. Sustainability, people talk about sustainability, they always talk about recyclability. It is true that we can recycle, but in a material form, fine. But I think we need to go beyond a material form. We have to recycle beams and components. Components, beams and cars have to be reused. There is no need for throwing that material, putting it into a sinter, and then making a melting and again reforming it. This type of research is currently being carried in Australia, where they recycle the components, not the material. Uh, large, can, large span structures is very, very important, and more importantly, more carpet area. Why carpet area? Because bigger the column, lesser is your carpet area. So if you go to Singapore, for example, every 20 years they demolish a structure. Every 20 years they demolish a structure and you ask why they demolish a very good structure because they call it as intensified use of land. Okay, 10, 10 story structures after 20 years will become 30 story structures because they have to increase the, they have to use the land much more wisely. So it means that they have to have more carpet space. If more carpet space, the column sizes should be smaller. If the column sizes should be smaller, obviously you have to go for a extremely good high quality steel, 450, 550, 650 MPA steel with composite construction, little bit of concrete in it. Structural steel is fast becoming the material of choice, whether we like it or not. And more than likely, we should not make decision based on initial cost. We should make decision based on life cycle cost, which includes your salvage value, which is 30% of the cost of your construction. The material can be, re can, you can get back the material. Most of, basically, if you do it in RC structure, you demolish the structure, what you get is garbage. Right, so how do we do that? So if you have a steel structure, then you can reuse at least in a material form or in a form of a component or a beam. Thank you.